All right. Well, um, welcome everyone. We are excited to virtually see you tonight, or I guess for you to see us tonight. <laughs> I'd rather see your wonderful faces, but that time will come again soon. My name is Lindsay Giese. I'm the Executive Director for River Arts Inc. This is the third of a three-part lecture series that we hosted this, this year. And uh, it was originally programmed because this is River Arts Inc's 20th anniversary. And some of the first events on the River Arts Center stage was a lecture series. And a lot of that lecture series included um, information about the Badger Lands and Badger Army am Ammunition Plant. So it's only fitting that we bring back some of those discussions this year. This was intended to be live at the River Arts Center, but we're, we're gonna have to go with second best until we can all meet there again. And if you are interested in seeing the first two, the, the first lecture we did was on the transformation of Badger. So a little bit flip-flopped. We're gonna talk about, the, uh, today we're gonna talk about as the ammunition plant before, but the first lecture was about after the amu Army ammunition plant was dissolved. And uh, the last lecture that we did was actually just about the greater Driftless area, a beautiful movie that was created by um, George Howe. And uh, that, that film is no longer available. The, our link is no longer available, but you can still purchase the film through Sustainable Driftless. But the first lecture is still available on our website. And this lecture will also be available at a later date, but uh, stay tuned for the whole thing so that you can ask questions at the end. And this, lecture, this whole lecture series was made possible thanks to a grant from the Community Foundation of South Central Wisconsin, formerly the Greater Sauk County Community Foundation, and through a generous grant by Craig Culver. So thank you so much for that support so we can continue to have events of some kind. And without further ado, I would like to introduce to you our guest of honor this evening. He is the president and curator archivist for the Badger History Museum. I'm sure if you're here, you already know a lot about this gentleman. Here is Verlin Mueller. We're all virtually clapping for you, Verlin. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Good evening. Okay. Uh, as I was saying, you're looking at, you're going to see this picture again a little bit late in, early in the program. But this is a 1942 photograph uh, about June 42 of, during construction of the Badger Ordnance Works. Uh, some of the text at the bottom says World War II, largest ammunition, world's largest ammunition plant, uh, 10,565 acres. In land mass, it was not the largest. Uh, several others were bigger. Uh, I, have, I haven't been able to do re enough research on all the other facilities, but I think Badger might have had the biggest capacity, smokeless production, uh, excuse me, smokeless propellant production capacity, and also rocket production capacity. And I'll talk about some other things a little bit later in the program. Uh, so there is sometimes some dispute, dispute about who's the biggest, but uh, since I'm talking, Badger was the biggest. Uh, and with that, uh, oh, and a couple other things. Uh, the program is on a timer because I talk too much. Uh, so I will entertain questions at the end of the program. But during the program, uh, I don't have time to answer questions because the computer doesn't wait for me. I may tell it to wait a couple of times during the program, but I try to keep that to a minimum. Otherwise, it gets too long. Uh, this should be about 35 minutes. The first time I ran a, the, this program, or an earlier version of it, it turned into two hours, and that's an hour and a half too long. So with that, uh, let me get this program started and we will move forward i think i thought we would there we go uh this is a a, a map of wisconsin showing you where the badger ammunition plant is right down there towards the bottom of the map uh in sauk county uh Wisconsin. Okay. Uh, this is a, a little more of a close up, and you'll see Baraboo to the north, Prairie de Sac and Sauk City to the south, and Merrimack to the uh, east. Uh, 10,565 acres. We know there were 100, 109 property owners, uh, three schools, three churches, three cemeteries, 26 cottages, Wiggins Bay, and 74 farms 
including woodlots and residences. Uh, so that's uh, a lot a lot of property taken for badger ordinance works. Uh, criteria for site location, and I'm gonna go through some of this stuff fast. Uh, rural location away from a large metropolitan area, you don't put an explosive plant in the middle of a big city. Close to a large volume water supply, a uh, good source of electric energy, access to rail and highway transportation. I have 250 miles here from the north, nearest border. I think I should that should be 200. Uh, soil base able to support heavy equipment, I added that. Uh, and then an available labor force, that's probably the only thing that, that it didn't meet where it was. Uh, here we see a land acquisition plat map of the plant. Uh, shows you some of the uh, places that were, areas that were taken. And this insert, and there's another set coming up, uh, is the Lakeside School, and the arrow points to on the map where the school was located. This photograph of the four gentlemen and their teacher, uh, all four of these boys grew up on, and a couple of them owned farms in 42 when the land was taken. This is the largest church in the area. This was the Sumter Methodist Church. And in a moment, we're gonna see the choir for this church. Uh, this church was uh, taken for a badge ordinance. The building was torn down and I believe it was used to build a church in West Baraboo. I'm not sure of that. Uh, a painting in, in the chancel was taken down and uh, that had been purchased by, I think a church in Reedsburg. And this is the choir for that church around 1899. Everyone you see in this picture lived on a farm taken for Badger Ordinance. And the lady at the in the front row at the far right owned property taken for the Badger Ordinance Works. The gentleman behind her is her brother. Uh, second lady from the left and the gentleman behind her are brother and sister. Uh, the lady in the second row at the left was a granddaughter of a, one of the first two settlers on the Sauk Prairie and married a Tarnitzer in Prairie de Sac. Her piano is at the Tripp Museum. Uh, this is some of the uh, first pictures, earliest pictures we have of construction at Badger. This was taken by my sister's father-in-law. Uh, they're working, uh, I think I've identified where they're working, but it's kind of hard to explain it with words, but uh, across, the, across the road in the upper left corner of the picture, they're building a railroad classification yard and I think that's what these gentlemen are getting sand for, is for those road beds. The large chunks you see in the uh, foreground are not stones, that's frozen, frozen earth. I think this picture was taken perhaps in early March or possibly even February. The other ground was still frozen. Uh, this is a photograph looking south uh, from partway up the bluffs on Highway 12. Uh, and you see some white buildings in the distance. Those are buildings from the badge, for the Badge Ordinance Works. Uh, construction was fast. Uh, you could come into work in the morning and it'd be a cement slab ready for a building. That evening, there would be a completed building on that slab. Uh, this is uh, looking at the front part of the plant. That uh, framework, open framework you see is the steel steel work for the powerhouse. Uh, the building at the left end was a recreation hall and that was later added to another wing to the right of it was added onto that building uh, early in the, uh, World War II. And Highway 12 in the front of us. And you see some some work, uh, let's, let's back up. You see some work right here. That's the northbound lane of Highway 12. And what's in the foreground is the southbound. That is the original Highway 12. And we'll move forward. Uh, this is the administration building. Uh, this is a multiple exposure photograph. These photographs, last several photographs were taken by my father and he was using a box camera. And those cameras, you had to advance the film manually and the camera would, get, would take multiple pictures without having the film advanced. And that's what happened to him here. 
those hills are the bluffs. And some of this is, uh, I think, excavation for the reservoirs up in the hill. This is that same picture you saw at the beginning with, without the text on it, uh, showing some of the construction. Here's the, here's the administration building uh, that we saw in the last, I think last photograph. Uh, all this back here is construction materials for, for construction of the plant. There's about five railroad sidings in here and roads in between where trucks could go in to pick, pick material up. Uh, here's the powerhouse and the rest we will look at later once in a while. Uh, this is looking north from the south. This is the magazine area in the front. Right here was a uh, magazine area for the TNT. And when they started construction, they started building a smokeless plant and a TNT plant. And this, this was later turned into the rocket production area. This is the area that you were looking at in the previous photograph and you were looking from the west. Uh, this is part of con TNT construction. This was a powerhouse for the TNT. This was to be a powerhouse, just like the one that was in the front. This was never finished. Uh, before they completed the TNT construction, uh, the existing facilities had made some changes, increased their production capacities, and uh, TNT planted Badger was not needed. So before the end of 42, they curtailed construction on that. Uh, this is a late 42 photograph, and you see most of this construction is already done. Uh, and I'm not sure what month this photo was taken, I think possibly October. Uh, they had an early snowfall that year. And in January, uh, an area back here started production. Now, I'm assuming you can all see my mouse moving around on, this, on the screen. Uh, yep, we can. Down, down in the front, uh, you see some H-shaped buildings. That was uh, Army Barracks built for single employees working at Badger that later became known as North Badger, North Badger Village. This is the construction of the pumping station at Wiggins Bay. Uh, this is, uh, you see it's all landlocked. When they completed construction, this area here was uh, excavated out to let the water into the pumping station. This pumping station was capable of 84 million gallons a day, and you're going to see an inside shot in a moment. There, oh, not quite. Uh, this is a close-up of the pumping station, and this little piece up here is a guard shack. There was a guard up here uh, at least at night, if not 24-7. As this was open to Wiggins Bay, this was... Uh, there was a fear of sabotage. And this is inside uh, these pumps, these motors in the back here, these are 500 horse motors and there's three of them. Those are the primary pumps for pumping water up to the uh, filtration plant. And you're gonna see that in a moment. Uh, these uh, front ones, I'm not sure uh, what these did if they were these also possibly pumped up to the filtration plant uh, at a lower capacity or something like that. These are smaller motors. And you can see by the gentleman that's in back of them, they were big motors. Here's the filtration plant. This excavation area here is the 58 inch water line coming up from the river pumping station. This work you see in the back here is construction of the uh, two reservoirs rather here. Uh, this is the uh, uh, stuff they dug out. Uh, when in digging the reservoirs, they expanded the size of this hill. And down here is the filtration plant. Water was pumped up to the filtration plant. If the sand filters, which you see here, uh, were full, then it was uh, diverted. The, power, the filtration plant diverted it up to the reservoir. This is looking from above the reservoir. And this is, uh, I think, probably 43. In fact, I'm sure it's 43. We see smoke coming from the powerhouse up here. Uh, that didn't start up until around January of 43, December 42, something like that. Uh, this is the filtered water reservoir. And then there's another one to the left off the picture that was the raw water. Uh, this reservoir is a 4 million gallon capacity and the raw water was 6 million gallons. These reservoirs were about 20 feet deep. Here you see a completed 
filtration plant. Three of the four fil uh, filters are in operation. These were sand and charcoal filters. The, and when the water <clears throat> was taken from the filtered water reservoir, it came back here to the filtration plant, was chlorinated, and that was all of our processed water and drinking water. So I drank river water for most of the years that I worked at Badger. And I forgot to mention, I worked here for 26 years. Uh, this is looking at the old, what we've heard to is the old acid plant down here in the front. Uh, this is a uh, seal, beeline nitrocotton area. And behind this is a green, what was referred to as green powder. I'll tell you right now, there is no such thing as green powder. That's a process in the production of smokeless propellant. These were all finishing buildings for the smokeless propellant. Some of these I will talk about briefly a little bit later in the program. Uh, this is another shot. This is looking north. Uh, these are all change houses. And these, these are the clock alleys. And this was guard headquarters. And then the bus station is off to the left in the lower corner. We see the powerhouse under construction. At this point in the construction, this was a four boiler powerhouse. For those of you that have been by and seen it, you know it was a five, it had five stacks. When they discontinued construction of the TNT area, they moved one of the boilers for that down here and made this one a five boiler powerhouse. This is a nitrating uh, building for uh, producing nitrocellulose, also known as nitrocotton. This is where we mix the cotton or wood pulp with the uh, nitric acid. <clears throat> this is a concrete and uh, masonry building. <clears throat> The, because of the high acid content. And you're gonna see some inside shots in a moment. And this is during construction, so, so a lot of things aren't complete here. This is inside on what was referred to as the dipping floor. This was the second floor. Uh, this would have been the second row of windows from the previous photograph. Uh, they, this tub at the left, uh, we would fill this with uh, a way in, uh, cotton or wood pulp, and then skid it down on these tracks here, which are just steel half rounds, and uh, the tub would slide very easily on these. And then when they get to where they want it, they slid it over to here and hook the rim in this uh, area here, and that locks it. And then you see here, and then you tip it into this funnel, and this gentleman is raking cotton or wood pulp, I'm not sure which, into a vat of nitric acid. Uh, nitric acid is not explosive. The cotton and wood pulp are not explosive, but you mix them together and you have a high explosive called nitrocellulose. <clears throat> and this was the basis for all the products we made at Badger. Uh, from the uh, nitrating area, once the, the, the nitrocellulose went through several purification stages and then uh, came here to what was referred to as the dehy press house, uh, dehydration press house. That's where the dehy comes from. Uh, it, the, the nitrocellulose is wet, so they have to press the water out of it, and that's done in this press. And early in that process, they inject some alcohol in it to help remove the water, and then they squeeze all that out of it and form this disc. Uh, and here you see a coffin buggy. Uh, we call it a coffin buggy because it sort of resembles a coffin on wheels. Uh, I might also add that if uh, one of these uh, wheels of nitrocellulose in here caught fire, the whole works is gonna burn right now and the people in back of it are gonna get their hair singed. They wouldn't be able to get away from it quick enough. So it was a dangerous process, a dangerous job. But if you followed uh, procedures and safety rules, uh, you were you were okay. Uh, these two gentlemen are raking uh, a nitrocellulose and solvent out of a mixer where the solvent and was uh, and a, a stabilizing agent were mixed with it. This is one of the first stages in the well. This is the first stage after the dehy press, and this is in the green powder area. Uh, that is explosive material. The coveralls they're wearing are treated with an, a flame retardant and their shoes are probably conductive. I say probably because this is a World War II picture. I'm not sure if they had conductive shoes in World War II. Uh, they may have. Uh, this is a, a press where they're pressing strands of 
nitrocellulose that will be cut, you know, as you see in a moment, into uh, pellets for a smokeless propellant. The gentleman in the background is loading a block of nitrocellulose into a press, and the lady in the front is extruding uh, the, the propellant. This is the largest pre size propellant we made. These strands are about a half inch in diameter. Here you see a lady cutting those strands into pellets. These strands are again about a half inch in diameter and those pellets are about an inch and three eighths long. This was propellant used in the eight inch howitzer. This was the biggest we made at Badger. Uh, the big guns like on the battleships also use smokeless but we didn't make it for those. Another facility made the pellets for those and those pellets were uh, an inch in diameter, I think it was, and two inches long. Those were a little bigger. Uh, you'll see this uh, stand. This is where, this is uh, next to that cutting machine. And uh, as the machine cut the pellets, it dropped them into tubs. And those tubs have a, a mesh bottom in them. And this, what you're seeing here, these with the patterns in that floor, there's a, it's connected to a vacuum system to draw the alcohol fumes out of the propellant. It's, uh, the solvent is ether alcohol. Uh, also, I don't know if we saw it in the previous building, but there is a ventilation system in there to remove the alcohol fumes. These gentlemen are uh, laying a wood track in front of a building in the rocket area. This, is, uh, this was from the rehabilit rehabilitation for a Korean operation and they're drilling holes to bolt some, uh, I think, hard maple uh, track down to the uh, uh, gravel ties. This was done so that there would be no sparks from the steel wheels on the steel track in front of that building. Uh, this is uh, how the material was moved. This is at a solvent recovery house where the ether alcohol was finally less it was removed from the uh, propellant. Uh, this is a narrow gauge uh, locomotive with uh, several cars on it. And this is stopped because they had a minor accident. Uh, the, there's a one car that looks like it doesn't have anything on it. Uh, the stuff that was supposed to be on it is behind it on the ground. Uh, the car dropped, jumped the track or something and made a mess. Uh, here are some of those large uh, smokeless propellants. Uh, being loaded from a, a buggy into a, an air dry uh, vessel. From the solvent recovery, they went to a water dry to remove the, re the, night, the ether alcohol that the solvent recovery couldn't get out. And now you have wet powder. So now it goes to an air dry where they blow warm air through it to remove the water to dry the powder out. Wet powder is good. Uh, ether, we made our own ether alcohol at Badger from grain alcohol. We got the grain alcohol in railroad tank cars. And there were five storage tanks uh, to the left off the photograph. Each one would hold about 235,000 gallons. Uh, you'll see a gentleman on the deck at the top of this escape chute. Uh, if something went wrong, you jump in that chute and slide down like a, uh, like in a, a slide. And when you get to the bottom, you want to be running. I usually say you want to be running because uh, either there's another operator coming behind you or the building. Uh, this is a control panel. Uh, this was put in in World War II. This is the same control panel that we used to control this operation during Vietnam. I had to work on some of this stuff once in a while. Uh, my job was an instrument man. I worked in the instrument shop. I could be sent to any production building in the plant. This could be interesting, interesting work. Uh, this is from that platform where you saw the operator standing in the previous picture. And this gives you an idea of the view that he had with one exception. If you look at that chute, you see there's a hole in it. If this building were in operation, it would not be. Uh, this safe the escape chute is not safe and the building would be shut down until this was fixed. But this was, uh, this was a photograph I took as part of the Army's uh, commitment with to meet the uh, requirements of uh, Section 106 of the uh, Historic Preservation Act of 94. And so I was in that building, took, took that photograph as part of my project. Uh, this gentleman is making nitroglycerin. 
We used nitroglycerin in the production of uh, rocket propellant. It was mixed with the nitrocellulose. Uh, he put uh, a measured amount of nitric acid in that uh, vessel, and he has his hand on a dead man valve, meaning that if he lets go, the valve closes, and he's uh, putting glycerin into the acid. There's a temperature gauge that he has to watch to main, be sure it doesn't get too hot or too cold, and uh, then it's agitated. Uh, this gentleman, I think, is uh, taking a, a, a scum off the top of, uh, of a, a nitroglycerin tank. I think this might be the uh, uh, settling tank or the separating tank, but I'm not sure. It's interesting considering that he's dipping that dipper into nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin is a liquid. Uh, this is uh, uh, what we call an angel buggy. Uh, you're going to see one of these being loaded in a moment. There are two copper tanks on this buggy. Each tank will hold 125 pounds of pure nitroglycerin. Uh, and then a gentleman, a pusher, uh, pushed this down a, a wooden wheeling walk like the, what you see it sitting on to the next building. I don't think I have to tell you why we called it an angel buggy. Here you see some gentlemen uh, loading the angel buggy. Uh, the guy in the way back is checking one of the storage tanks. The guy in the middle has his hand on a uh, clamp that just clamps down on a very soft rubber hose to shut it off. He's also the guy who's gonna push this angel buggy to the next building. And then the guy at the right has, a, has the hose and he holds it into the opening in the tank. Right now, these guys are not loading any nitroglycerin. This is a posed photograph for the photographer. Uh, this is a building that was originally to have been a TNT uh, magazine storehouse. And this was when the rocket area was built. The rocket area was built where the TNT magazine was originally going to be. And this building was repurposed into a narrow gauge tram repair shop. And I think we're gonna see an inside shot of that in a moment. There we are. Uh, these tram uh, locomotives are laid away. They're ready for the next operation. I think this photograph was taken at the end of World War II and everything was laid away. They had to modify the floor of the building a little bit to get those trams down uh, and get the track in there and to get the trams down a little bit to be worked on. This is a rocket roll house. This is where they brought uh, a, a material called uh, rocket paste. It wasn't a paste, it was flakes. And they brought it into this building and loaded it in uh, a measured amount, weight amount into a roll that rolled it into sheets. And you're gonna see one of those machines being unloaded in a moment. This gentleman is unloading uh, a roll press. And what I should point out, you see a nozzle here, there's a nozzle here, there's some up here and here and here. And there's this is a trip and this is a sensor. Uh, if something goes wrong that this ignites, those are going to dump a lot of water right now. Uh, we've been, I've been told that when those things went off, the water, it was almost instantly coming out of the building in two to three inches deep. That gentleman was going to get wet, but getting wet is a lot better than burned. Uh, this lady is in a, uh, a slitter and roll house. Uh, she's <clears throat> the sheets of rocket propellant were cut into, I think, four or six inch strips, and then they're rolled on this uh, in this roll, what we would call a carpet roll, because it looks looking at the end of it, it looks like a, a carpet roll. This roll is just about done. They they're 14 inches in diameter, so I think she has this one just about finished. From the slitter house, it came to the uh, press house. This is a rocket press. You can see a press in a moment. Uh, the press is here under this mound. This is a concrete tunnel covered in soil. This is the extrusion room, and you'll see inside that in a moment. The control room is back here in a concrete room, concrete walls, floor, and ceiling. And there's about 12 feet of co uh, concrete and soil between the press in here and this control room. Then there's a mechanical room next to it 
and a utility room. Here you see the rocket press. This, uh, the die goes in this front part here, and then this closes, and this is pretty heavy, uh, and the die is heavy, that's why the chain fall is here, so they to lift the die into place. Uh, the, there's, those 14 inch carpet rolls were put in here. All of this you see back here is a hydraulic ram. Uh, hydraulic pressure when the, when the extrusion starts, when it breaks through, is about 1,500 pounds per square inch hydraulic. And I think this ram is about 30 inches in diameter. I could be wrong, it might not be quite that big. The ram pushing against the carpet roll was 14 inches. This is what, we, what was made in the rocket area in World War II and Korea. It's called a cruciform. You see a better one here. Uh, it's shaped like an X. Uh, it was called, it was, uh, its name was a cruciform. Uh, the rocket grain we made during Vietnam was a little bit different. And uh, I can talk about that later end of the program and the end of this program. Here again, you see a lot of nozzles uh, to, for uh, deluge fire, fire control system. Uh, this is the ball powder area. This was built in 1954. Uh, if the Badger Army knife wasn't the biggest before, it was after this was built. Uh, this tall building was a wet screen house. Back here were the hardening houses where the rocket, where the ball powder grains were made. Ball powder looks like grains of sand. <clears throat> uh, the rocket or smokeless propellant was a pellet and rocket propellant was a long stick. This is inside the uh, hardening house. Uh, three weeks after I went to, came to work at Badger, the still at this location in the number one house blew up. Uh, that was my introduction to Badger. I was two miles away as the crow flies and I heard it immediately. I worked, I spent a lot of time working in this building. I had electronics background and these instruments are all electronic. So I spent most, most of my time on electronic instrumentation. And there's a story about this that I could tell you a little bit later too. Uh, here we're looking at a still with uh, this cover open. Uh, periodically, after about so many batches, uh, an operator, a man, someone had to go in the still with a uh, bronze uh, scraper and scrape off the dried material on the inside of the still. Just like when you cook something on the stove a little bit wrong and it burns on, same thing happened here. Uh, the ball powder, the lacquer would burn onto the inside of the still and had to be scraped off. This is the wet screen house. The hardening process, uh, they have some control over the size of the grains, but not total control. So in this building, there were uh, screens from the top, this top level all the way down to this level. And uh, the screen for undersize, which went back to went back and recycled and all the sizes in between were usable and those went to the next stage to be, um, uh, uh, treated with nitroglycerin. Ball powder was a double base propellant. It had nitrocellulose and nitroglycerin in it. These gentlemen are uh, low transferring uh, containers of ball powder from a truck to a rail car for shipment to a load assemble pack plant where, where the ball powder was loaded in the final ammunition used by our soldiers. Uh, this is from Vietnam. Uh, and I can usually identify Vietnam people because they're wearing hard hats. Prior to this, uh, there was some case there were hard hats during Korea, none during World War II. We had uh, also had standard gauge rail at Badger. We had two locomotives when we were in production. And this is a locomotive uh, garage. Uh, and this would hold two locomotives and that's about it. And you're gonna see inside this building in a moment. Here we go. Uh, here's the track You run a locomotive over this pit. And then operator uh, maintenance mechanics can get, there's the stairs, goes down into the pit and they can get to the underside of the locomotive. It's awful hard to uh, put a 60 ton locomotive up on a hydraulic lift like we do our cards. So instead they ran them over this pit and worked on them that way. And people got hungry. I'm not sure why. Uh, I have the same problem. 
this is a cafeteria in back of the administration building. This was a 400 seat cafeteria. And the menu today is, uh, well, I, can, I can't quite see all of it. And on the side, I, I've got uh, object, some stuff in the way here. Uh, but anyhow, fr uh, uh, French onion soup, I think it was chopped suey with uh, something, uh, hot beef and so on. I wish they had gotten a picture would include the prices. That would have been interesting. Uh, this was the bus station where people coming to work, uh, you get here a little before time to clock in. So they stop in here and there was a canteen in this end of the building. You could get service from outside here under the, sh under the shelter or you could go inside and get service. And canteen would, uh, had sandwiches. You could, buy, if you forgot to pack a lunch or intentionally didn't pack a lunch or whatever, you could get, get your sandwiches here from the in, inside these windows or the outside. I get a kick out of the sign on the benches. I thought people in World War II knew better than that. Apparently not. Uh, at these windows, you could buy bus tickets. And uh, <clears throat> for the first year and a half, there was rail service. <clears throat> That was construction production. And after about a year and a half, they discontinued, rail discontinued that, I think for lack of passengers because everybody was riding the bus. Uh, at the beginning of the program, you saw the H-shaped buildings. This is inside one of those. Uh, this was a, a two person room, uh, bunk beds, and here are their closets and a writing table. and a radio, no TV. And this is uh, part of Badger Village. This is a six apartment apartment building. Uh, I think, uh, uh, they, 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 these were heated. I think we're gonna see an inside photograph in a moment. Uh, each one of these stacks is an apartment. So you see there's six of them. And there's another door on the back side. Uh, and these were one or two, some of them were two bedroom apartments, some are one bedroom. This is one of the single family units. This is a two bedroom unit. There's a bedroom here and a bedroom over here. The one bedroom unit didn't have this part of the building on it. There was just this straight wall. And then kitchen, dining room and front room, all one room right in this area. And you're going to see inside this one, one of these in a moment. Here. Uh, first time I looked at these pictures, I looked at these cupboards and saw these holes. And I just about fell off the chair. Uh, that's how you, got, how you open the door. Stick your finger through the hole and open the door. This was the heat for the entire housing unit. This, this is a single family unit, one bedroom. Uh, this is a coal burner. And we have one of these in the museum without this outer jacket on it. This, uh, this jacket was here for protection. If you touch that stove, you get burned immediately. This is your cooking stove and that's your oven. Uh, in the picture of the choir, you saw this lady on the right end of the uh, fr front row of people. This was her farm. This was taken for uh, staff village. The house was left standing. That is still standing today, uh, occupied. All the rest of these buildings were gone. And about where this barn is, you're going to see in a moment a two-story staff village building. Here. I think this building is about where that barn was. And this was, uh, the staff village was for management people. Badger, Badger village was for hourly people. Uh, they, those weren't quite as nice. This one. Uh, these had a much nicer kitchen, uh, pulls, handles on the cupboard doors, electric stove, refrigerator. Uh, the apartment buildings had uh, ice boxes, at least during World War II. This is a photograph that I took in 1998. Uh, this is a similar as view of what you saw at the very beginning uh, in color. And uh, this, this was the completed facility. Uh, I'm not sure if I have, we'll see in a moment. 
Uh, Dave Fordham needed some aerial photographs uh, of the plant and I, he knew that I was a photographer. He had the plane and the pilot's license, so he took me up and we took a series of pictures of Badger. This is uh, the, basically that same scene. Uh, these were the two buildings that were you saw in the previous one. Let's just back up. You see, no, you don't see those. There's two buildings off the picture here. Uh, in that this is the only picture you see, the only building you see in this photograph that's in the next one, the gas station. This is our museum. And here, this was the combined shops building. This was central stores. Everything that came into the plant for maintenance materials was uh, came through this building. This was the powder lab, and this was the fire station. Everything else is gone. This photograph was taken on December 2nd, uh, in 2012. Uh, this area all looks nice and green now. The farmer's memorial is right here, and it was there already when this photograph was taken. Uh, this picture, this building was here, you saw in that early picture where we had the framework of the powerhouse. And with that, I want to thank you for your time, invite you to visit our museum on the site of the former Badger Army ammunition plant between Sauk City, Prairie Sac, and Baraboo on US Highway 12. We're open Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 4. And our website, if you want more information, you can see there, badgerordinancehistory.org. Don't, do not put an I in ordinance. It's not the same and it won't work. You won't get you to this website. Also, I want to thank uh, Lindsay and River Arts for making this event possible and suggest that you could, uh, if you like to make a donation, you make donations to both of us, our organizations, Badger History Group. Uh, you can do that through our website uh, and use a credit card or uh, Lindsay through their website. Uh, it costs money to operate our, our pro projects or our operations. And without the archive, the Badger History Group, this PowerPoint would not be possible. And without the efforts of Lindsay and River Arts, this event would not have happened. And with that, I thank you very much for your time and I'm ready for questions. All right. Yes, thank you so much, Verlin. We've got <laughs> lots of questions that uh, rolled in. So I'm just gonna, um, share them with you in the order they came. If you okay. have questions, just feel free to keep typing in that chat box. But uh, here we go, Verlin. Are you ready? Maybe with someone will stop. I don't know. It could happen. <laughs> um, Joe Winch. See if you can stump me. <laughs> Joe Winch shared. Actually, it's kind of fitting that this is the first message since this is kind of um, where we ended. Um, he said in about 1972, his father purchased Staff Village, a collection of 16 single family homes constructed constructed to house workers at the plant, and it cost 56,000 at that time. I'm, I'm assuming he's like for that, that was for the whole, uh, whole Staff Village. Whoa. Could be, I'm not sure. Uh, recently, in some of the research I was doing for you, uh, came across uh, the individual housing units. Uh, I think the family units were $2,500 a piece. Wow. He did. He also, because Carol asked where those were located, so maybe you can shine a light more on that, but he said it was about two miles from the plant. Is that accurate? No. Badger Village was right across Highway 12. What about the staff? The main village? gate. Staff Village is about a quarter of a mile south. Okay. The staff Village was at the S-Bend, so wow. maybe that's a little more than a quarter mile. All right, here's, an, we got another question here um, from Scott. We just learned that our great grandfather was a farmer who worked on building the Badger Ordnance Works. Are there any public records or pictures of those who worked on building Badger? Unfortunately, we do not have an employee list. We couldn't get it because the employee list included social security numbers and addresses. And when today's world of identity theft, uh, you don't let that stuff out. How dangerous was it to work there? Uh, well, worst case, and I shouldn't start this way, but I'm going to anyhow. Worst case, the worst explosion in the history of the powder plant was on July 19th, 1945. That killed four men. That was a nitroglycerin storehouse. We've been told that left a hole in the ground 80 feet across and 20 feet deep. So it was, it was dangerous. But if you followed procedures, 
uh, you had, uh, if you're working in explosives area, you had flame retardant treated coveralls, a hard hat, or, well, not necessarily a hard hat. Uh, some areas it was a soft uh, hat. Some of them covered the entire back down to the neck so that powder wouldn't slide down back in, in, in between you and your clothes. And that hat was also treated with a flame retardant. And you wore conductive shoes and the floors were conductive or wet. Uh, so no static electricity or an absolute minimum. Uh, and if you followed procedures, you were safe. Uh, an interesting aside on that, in 1973, the National Safety Council came out with a statistic that on a date early that year, we had killed more people on our nation's highways than had been killed in all of the wars we had fought to that date. Uh, that same year, we had a defensive driving course in the, in the plant for employees. And one day when I uh, left the parking lot and was going out this main entrance, there was a banner across the entrance facing in. Well, that's strange. The banner across the entrance should be facing out for people coming into the plant. Well, this one was facing inside and was for those of us leaving. And if I remember correctly, it said, caution. You, I, I try to say that and say this whole thing on a straight face, I have trouble. Caution, you are now entering the most dangerous part of your day going on the public highway. Wow. So yeah, it was it was dangerous, but it was safe. Well, and I, I in don't... the history of the plant, we had only 10 fatalities from explosions. That was what I was gonna ask because in, our, yeah. in us working together for the interpretive signs for the Great Sox State Trail, Mm -hmm. um, that was some information that came up because that question gets asked a lot and not to say that yeah. those 10 lives or you know whatever the exact number was um, that those are very important lost lives but in the grand scope of how many workers were there it is a pretty small yeah and considering what we were doing and you saw a picture of some gentlemen raking material out of uh, a, a mixer in the green powder area that was explosive and the entire smokeless process from beginning to end was labor intensive all the way through, there was somebody eyeball to eyeball with something that could kill them instantly or burn them so bad they'd wish they were dead. Um, Bob has several questions and I'm gonna poke fun at him because okay. the first one is all capitalized, which means he really <laughs> is yelling this question and wants to know, <laughs> was the escape slide used ever? Uh, I've heard of some of some slides being used. I don't know about that one in that photograph. Okay. Uh, that would have been That would have been a thrilling ride and if it happened in the winter time, uh, the chances of ending up with a broken leg or both of them at the bottom are better than even because you're gonna hit the hard ground uh, pretty fast. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that beats the daylights out of being burned to death yeah. or uh, blown up. How many workers were employed at the height of construction? Uh, there are four answers to that question. The construction employment peaked in August of 42 at over 12,000. That's why they started building Badger Village. Uh, production employment during World War II peaked at over 7,500 and Korea and Vietnam were each at over 5,000. So that's, that's a lot of people worked out here. I estimate based on badge numbers and estimate that over 60,000 people have gone through the gates of Badger in the history of the plant. What percentage of the workforce was female? During, well, when Michael Gock, excuse me, when Michael Gock was writing his book, Powder People in Place, in his research, he found that at the end of World War II, approximately 50% of the employees were female. And that, that's from the office workers to production workers. Uh, we have a display in the museum of WOWs. WOWs is women ordinance workers. I'd never heard of that until I came, got out here working on this history. Everybody knows about Rosie the Riveter, but very few people know about the WOWs. <laughs> Korea and Vietnam, I'm not sure what the percentage was, but it was high. Uh, Michael wants to know, was there, was there also a standard gauge railroad on the premises? There was standard gauge and narrow gauge. Uh, I'm not sure how much of each, each but it was, I think it was over 100 miles in both cases. Um, maybe you sort of answered this, but the so the hats the three guys are wearing in the nitro station was that more of the cloth like? Yeah, uh, I don't remember what they were wearing, but yeah, in the nitroglycerin area they didn't wear hard hats. 
because if something knocked it off and fell on the on the floor and there happened to be a nitroglycerin spill at that spot that's not a good idea mm -hmm. where nitroglycerin in general, is pressure sensitive where in general did the workforce come from uh all over uh during construction uh they hired some people from jamaica they were hired in jamaica and their contract had a clause in it if you are uh, die on the job your body will not be shipped back to jamaica there is a jamaican buried in the in the Baraboo cemetery who died on the job and his body was not shipped back but we had people coming uh commute all three operations from over 60 miles, I'm usually telling people about 90 miles, 80 to 90 miles in all directions. World War II by bus. Those buses were school bus type buses, half the size of today's school buses. And I don't think the seats were padded as good as they are today, which we would probably even complain about at that. Uh, and with a top speed of 45, 50 if you're lucky going downhill, uh, that's a long ride twice a day, that's a 12 and a half hour day because you're on the job eight and a half hours. You're paid for eight, but you, you've got lost time from going from the bus to the change house in reverse. Uh, and then that long ride home if you're coming from 80 or 90 miles. Yeah. Um, Jean, thanks for sharing your story. She said as a toddler and preschooler, she lived in one of the apartments there um, with her dad who was a UW student on a GI bill. Oh, yes. And her mom talked about the oven, she said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, dur during, after World War II, uh, UW population, I think, just about doubled. And they didn't have housing for that many students. So they reached an agreement with the Army. They used Badger Village uh, for student housing and then provided buses, uh, two buses, uh, two different schedules in the morning and then two different return schedules at night. Uh, Berlin, are there still several small cemeteries on the grounds? The cemeteries that were here when the land was acquired are still here. Pioneer Cemetery is the largest one. And one of the two set, uh, first two settlers on the Sauk Prairie is buried in that cemetery. Then there's the Talke Cemetery. That was a church cemetery. The Pioneer Cemetery was a community cemetery, no church associated. And then the Kingston Cemetery, which is off of Highway 78 on the east, uh, that was also taken. Uh, uh, the original acquisition included all of Wiggins Bay and uh, down to Groover's Grove Bay. Uh, there's also a, a single stone Miller Cemetery. Uh, that stone was found when they were building a railroad Y uh, where they could turn the train around or drive the train up and then back it into the old acid area. And when they were across, building that across the farmer's uh, farmyard, they uncovered that stone. Well, you see a stone like that, there's a grave here. Uh, I never understood a grave. This was by the outbuildings. When people buried their children at home, they build them buried them close to the house, not by the hog barn, <clears throat> which this I think this was close to. Uh, so I, I, could, I never understood that there would have been a, a grave there. And they did stop construction and did their uh, tests to, uh, to find out if there were graves there and they'd found nothing. Uh, it's three children, children of the Hiram and Mary Miller family. Uh, one died in 1852, one died in 1860 and one 1862, all of them under the age of six. Uh, they, and they are real. They are buried in the Prairie de Sac Cemetery. There is a family stone there, a large family stone, a Miller family stone, and it's an interesting stone. The front side is uh, uh, Horace Miller and his wife and a daughter, and I've forgotten their names. My apologies to them. And on one edge is another daughter, and on the opposite edge is a son who was killed in the Civil War in uh, Virginia and he's buried there and it says where he's buried. And then the backside is the three children of um, Hiram and, and Mary Miller. Hiram and Mary and their family left the area. Uh, I've forgotten just when I've chased them on the on, uh, genealogy. They moved to Adair County, Missouri and that's where they and, uh, finished, their, finished out their lives. 
Now those cemeteries, um, when the when the land got divided, are a lot of those on private property now? Uh, the Telke Cemetery, which is a smaller one, is on DNR land. The Pioneer Cemetery is on Ho Chunk land. <clears throat> I think the cemeteries uh, have been transferred, uh, but I'm not sure. And uh, uh, Ho Chunk is <clears throat> is working on. <clears throat> arranging access to the Pioneer Cemetery. Right now it's a little bit sketchy, although I think uh, I don't think they would keep anyone from visiting the cemetery. Uh, lots of praise coming in here, lots of thanks, just so you know, I'm not skipping the, I'm not skipping the <laughs> but well, thank you. the questions. Um, Bob asks, was it powder only that they made there? Yeah, we only made the propellant. I don't call it powder because it wasn't uh, interesting experience. I had a visitor come into the museum one day uh, before we had before we had to close for uh, because we transferred ownership. Uh, and he asked me, well, what was that powder like? Was that something like talcum powder? I said, no, it was not powder. Uh, smokeless powder is an extruded uh, pellet. Uh, rocket is an extruded stick. And then the ball powder looks like grains of sand. Something I could add about that rocket propellant that we made during Vietnam it was two and three quarter inches in diameter with a kind of a star or spline shaped center, hollow center, weighed 24 pounds and burned in six tenths of a second. So does it just kill you inside that they call it the powder plant? Uh, no, because that was pretty common. You know, that was the powder, it was the powder plant and we all, it was the powder plant. Uh, when I came to work here, it was Badger Army Ammunition Plant and the name had just changed not long before then. Uh, everybody knew it as the ordnance plant or the plant or the powder plant. Uh, very few people referred to it as the Badger Army Ammunition Plant. Uh, Joe just confirmed, well, he, probably a while ago while we were talking, but Joe confirmed that yes, the Staff Village was bought in the 1970s, all of the buildings for 56,000. Oh, okay. Well, Staff Village was bought by a, a lawyer in, from Maisel and he rented out the buildings. Uh, well, maybe Bluff that's Joe's dad or grandpa, whatever. <laughs> I yeah. have to scroll back up to see that message. It could be, hi, Joe. Thanks for, thanks for joining us and sharing that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. But, uh, Badger Village was uh, purchased by five gentlemen. He's five in 1960. That was Ron Nichols, Bill Fuchs, Harlan Packard, Wayne Hatz. And I think I'm forgetting something, somebody. Merlin, and, you're, you, you, there's a vault in there of knowledge. <laughs> oh Once in a while, the data retrieval system works and sometimes the database crashes. <laughs> it's, it's working today. Um, Sharon is wondering, was, well, you, you spoke a little bit about this, that um, there were people from uh, Jamaica, but was everyone there who, uh, everyone who worked there Caucasian? And if not, was segregation practiced? Uh, there were, no, they were not all Caucasian and yes, segregation was practiced. Uh, the Jamaicans were housed in a, the CC camp at Devil's Lake was rehabbed and that was where they lived. And uh, in Badger Village, uh, I, I don't know if there were any uh, colored people in there during World War II or not, I don't know. But uh, segregation, uh, at least outside the plant was practiced, yes. Um, Bob is wondering, there are still some bermed buildings on the Merrimack end of the property. What are those used for? Uh, there are some partially buried buildings, as you can see from Highway 78. All you see is the roof above ground and it's and the ground is mounted up to the uh, eaves of the roof. Uh, those are, I, I usually describe those as trench silos uh, with a roof on steroids. And I put it that way because the sidewalls at the at the floor level are about four feet thick of reinforced concrete. Those were built for magazines uh, storage of the rocket propellant. Those were built in 44 when the rocket area was built. The smokeless propellant was stored in wood frame buildings above ground. And you could also see those from Highway 78, except you can't anymore because they're all gone. So were those particular buildings just not removed just because of the site, like it would be so? Uh, yeah, they were not contaminated. And uh, most of them, I think there's one row is on DNR land. The rest of them are on, Ho on dairy forage land and they are using them. Oh, great. All right. Um, 
Someone, uh, Jerry says, someone who worked there in the early 1970s once told me that if you even accidentally showed up at work with matches or a lighter in your pocket, you were immediately fired. Is this uh, not the first time? Uh -oh. If you if you uh, showed up at the well, when after we clocked in, we had to go through a garden inspection booth, and they were looking for badges and that sort of thing, and then they had an inspection booth there, and. Uh, they would ask you, would you step inside, please? Then you open your lunchbox, empty your pockets, and they do a pat down. And this was men or women. The ladies were inspected by lady guards. The men were inspected by male guards. Uh, they were not mixed. And uh, they were looking for matches or cigarette lighters, cigarettes, uh, booze. Uh, those were the main no-nos to bring in. Uh, if you were uh, at that point, uh, you probably got a couple of days off if you were caught inside the area with uh, smoking materials it would be a little worse uh, a couple of stories to go with that uh, during vietnam operation and I, I i heard this story second or third hand uh, a supervisor went into a rocket propellant rest house which is a, a storage building in between processes and there were rocket grains in that building and he found cigarette butts on the floor next to some rocket grains. Somebody needed a nicotine fix awful bad or they had a death wish. Uh, the other one, uh, a supervisor in the inspection department had a, been in a meeting in the administration building where you could smoke. And he had to go past the guard shack to get there and then come back into the area. And he got back to the inspection office walked in the office with a cigarette in his mouth. The superintendent uh, held him back to his office and said, you're fired. Because he could just as easily, easily have been gone from his meeting in the ad building to an explosives building with a cigarette in his in mouth that would have been, could have been very disastrous. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, we got some really good questions in here. Okay, I'm so, I'm, there's so many, I'm gonna keep us moving along. I wanna be able to answer all the questions. Um, did the workers there know that the Armstrong brothers were targeting it? Ooh, <laughs> uh, I'm sure after, the, after, the, after they did, they heard about it. Mm -hmm. uh, we interviewed Carlton Armstrong when we did the video powder to the people. And he told us about that. His bombs were, I believe, mayonnaise jars with ammonium nitrate in them, no detonator. So all he had was the mayonnaise jars of contaminated fertilizer. Uh, and he was the bombardier. His brother, Dwight, was the pilot. They stole a plane from Maury's Airport in Middleton, flew it out here in a snowstorm, got lost, <clears throat> found Highway 12, and found their way to the plant. Carlton was the bombardier, and he was a pretty lousy one. He missed all of his targets. Uh, and then they dumped the plane at the Sauk Perry Airport, and one of their girlfriends was there with a car to take them, take them home. Uh, and I might add, one of the four men killed in the uh, nitroglycerin explosion was Carlton and Dwight Armstrong's uncle. And Carlton kind of credits that incident with some of his feelings for about Badger. Um, oh, uh, so some some of these are like questions and comments from your from the other questions you've already answered. Um, Carol said that her her dad said after World War II, some students had living quarters in Camp Randall as well. Besides, um, yeah, village. yeah, that'd be kind of fun. Yeah, the the university was scrambling for housing because uh, I think their student population doubled in one year. Uh, Pat wants to know what was the role or duties of the IBEW union electricians at the site? Uh, the uh, Badger was a closed shop. Everybody was in a union. There was a, a BOW council, which included all of the unions except the firefighters and guards. They had, they had a separate union, but otherwise all the other trades uh, and uh, production people, uh, chemical workers union, <clears throat> those were all under the BOW council. I was, uh, I had to uh, join the machinist union uh, working in the instrument shop. 
Um, here's a good plug for, for visiting the museum. Lori wants to know if there are more photos at the Museum of Employees during World War II um, that, that are pictured beyond what was in your presentation. And I bet oh, they- yes. yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, all of the pictures in, in my presentation will, are, are from our archive. Um, most of the pictures that are on display here are from the Army archive that we now own, uh, approximately estimated 50,000 images. And I have a few of those in the museum. I don't have space for more. Uh, I need a bigger building. If somebody can give us a 70,000 square foot building, I can use it. <laughs> hey, <laughs> yep. could be someone here. Um, so you answered this a little bit about the fact that it wasn't called the Badger Army Ammunition Plant at the beginning. Um, and this isn't the exact question, but I'm uh, kind of spinning off of it. Did, is Badger just because this is no, you know known as the Badger State, or where did the name come from? Yes, the name comes from Wisconsin, the Badger State. No matter where the powder plant would have been built in Wisconsin, it would have been the Badger Ordnance Works. Okay. And they were looking at a site in Adams County, uh, South County 1. Uh, and there's a story for that, and I won't, won't go into it now. It gets too long. Oh, boy. Well, people but it's a little about, politics. It's they, a little should politics. The, they should come to the museum and talk to you about it then. Yes, right? you bet. Uh, how many books have been written on the plant and are any available for purchase currently? The only book I'm aver, aware of, of the powder plant is specifically is Michael Gock's book, Powder People in Place. That book is out of print. Uh, it is available in the local libraries. If you're, if you're in the South Central Library area uh, and your library doesn't have it, they can get it through the South Central Library system. Um, Heather is sharing with us that maybe one of the names that um, was escaping you is Woody Zantow as one of the- That's the one, that's yeah. The, oh, this is, we've yeah. got a good audience here. <laughs> yeah, we have all the answers. Um, oh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay, from Candace says, from recent research on the transfer of, uh, and I, I don't know how, how to pronounce this, the Telki Cemetery, is that what you call yes, it? Yes, Telki. Yeah, it's spelled Tholki, Yeah. but it's, it's pronounced Telki. So the Telki and Pioneer Cemeteries is that both continue on hold. The transfer of the Telki Cemetery needs to be approved um, via a governmental transaction at the state level, and the Ho-Chunk are also not pursuing the transfer since their focus is currently on the pandemic, understandable. Uh, yeah. She's got uh, family in both cemeteries. Could be. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, Jack's agreeing. Yep, Woody. Oh. <laughs> all, all, great, all great comments here. Um, did the powder and rocket propellant get shipped to Joliet? No, not that I'm aware of. Joliet was a TNT plant. Uh, our products went to Lake, Lake City, Iowa. Uh, Twin Cities, uh, Eden, Prairie, Eden Prairie, Minnesota. Um, during World War II, we shipped to Green River Ordnance Plant at uh, almost at, near Dixon, Illinois. There was also a load assemble pack plant uh, near Iliopolis, Illinois. But I think that I think their work was mostly bombs and large large projectiles, and we didn't make the prote uh, propellant for that stuff. Uh, and there were others, and I don't know. I don't know where all they are. But uh, those are the ones I know of. Okay. Um, Joyce says she recalls that there were watchtowers. How many were there, and how far apart were they? There were guard towers all the way around the perimeter of the plant. And when we did the, I don't know how far apart they were, but each tower was in. Uh, I'm not sure that they could all be seen by a, a, a neighboring tower, but they all could all see, they could see the area between them. And I, I, I get on that because when we did the video Powder to the People, we interviewed a couple of guys who had been guards out here during World War II. And we asked them, were all of those towers staffed with a guard and those guards were armed with a rifle, not a sidearm? And they said, no, we didn't have enough guards. So we, there was a guard in every other tower and they would move from one tower to another, uh, but every, all the towers, uh, they, they still were able to cover the entire area of the, of the fence. So you weren't gonna cross the fence without being seen. Uh, another interesting story with that, as a kid, and I was four years old when they started building this place. 
I can remember seeing streetlights around the perimeter and I could never understand why those streetlights were not over the street. They were over the fence. And it occurred to me after I was working out here one day, I don't know, I was out on the perimeter road for something. And all of a sudden I, I saw the stub of one of those poles that had been cut off. And all of a sudden it occurred to me, those were not street lights. Those were fence lights, lighting the fence for security. Uh -huh. And the fence is not at the boundary of the plant. There's uh, 100 to 200 feet of, power, of plant land outside the fence. And that was so they could control the vegetation out there and keep it mowed so you couldn't sneak through the tall grass. Uh, it, so we are, we still have a couple more minutes here. I've got a, a couple more questions. Um, if you have, if, if I missed something that you asked, um, retype it in. We don't, I, I want to try to get to everything, but I have a, a few other questions that I was given in advance. One of them, some of these are going to be hot topics, Verlin. <laughs> um, were the displaced farmers compensated? Yes, uh, they were paid, uh, but there's a catch to that. Uh, as near as I can tell, uh, they were paid market value for their properties. And in some work that uh, one of the volunteers was doing recently, he came across something where uh, I think it was the lawyer, the real estate lawyer working for the uh, group of farmers that were uh, protesting or going through the condemnation proceeding made the comment that uh, the, tr uh, the, what I say, the panel, the condemnation was a two-stage process. First, they went before a three-person panel and the lawyers felt that the prices that they set for their properties was uh, market value. Uh, the catch to all of that was that market value was depression value. So in, in the bottom line is they got reimbursed for original purpose purchase and that's it. Uh, they didn't get it. The, the depression screwed them, mm -hmm. not, the, not the government. Mm -hmm. um, were there still indigenous peoples on the land when Badger was built? No. Uh, however, we did have Ho-Chunk people working here. Okay. You know, just like anybody else. Uh, it was it was a job and a good paying job. Um, were were there any women involved in essential like authoritative roles at that time? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, yeah. I chuckle. Uh, during World War II, they have a they had a woman's liaison out here, and her job was kind of a go between between the women employees. And, and management, because neither had really been in that kind of experience before and didn't know how, didn't necessarily know how to react with each other. Uh, so she was maybe the closest to a female supervisor. Uh, was there um, testing on, on the site, like explosions and that kind of thing? Was there an area for that? Uh, yeah, uh, there was a ballistics area where they test fired propellant, hand loaded, and a test fired. Uh, small arms were fired in, uh, five, I think there were five ranges inside the ballistics building and they were te could test there anywhere from the M16 all the way up to the 20 millimeter uh, ammunition. Uh, 20 millimeters, uh, people in working in the area next to that range didn't appreciate it too much because they were kind of loud. Uh, then there's also a cannon range which is at the entrance to uh, what was known as Pine Hollow. It was a favorite picnic area uh, for the uh, people who were here before. Uh, and that's where they tested the big guns and they had some, we have a photograph of some of the uh, howitzers and uh, anti-aircraft uh, guns that they had. And they would set the barrel horizontal and fire it through a couple of screens that would start and stop a timer. That gave them the muzzle velocity and that was their test. And they fired into a couple of tunnels that would be filled with sand. The sand caught the inner projectile. Uh, and every so often they would take the sand out, separate the sand from the projectiles, put the sand back, and undamaged projectiles could be reused. And those tunnels are still there. But they're on Ho-Chunk land, so they're not accessible. <clears throat> 
Uh, Sharon shared with us that there's a great article about Badger in our Wisconsin magazine um, for the February, March, 2021 issue. So yes. great to know. Yes, and some of the some of the images they had there, they got from me. I bet they did, Berlin. <laughs> All right. Oh my goodness. I can't believe how you powered through a lot of content and information. Um, thank you so much, Verlin. Thank you for everybody watching for all the questions. This was, this was such a great discussion. Uh, and I'm not surprised that there are so many questions because, you know, it's yeah. an 80 year history and uh, a lot, a lot happened in that. On oh, that yes. so. Well, and something I could add, Badger Ordinance was the single most significant cultural and economic event on the South Prairie since the treaty was signed in 1837 and the settlers started crossing the river. That was the first one, Badger was the next one. That was the largest and nothing to match either of those has happened since. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you so much. I do have to, I, I want to thank our donors again one more time, the Community Foundation of South Central Wisconsin. Thanks to a generous donation by Craig Culver, so that we can host this lecture series virtually um, and still support places like the Badger History Museum and our other lecturers during this time. And if you also would like to make a donation, as Verlin mentioned, uh, check out the Badger History Museum. Go visit, see all the photos. It's a, a correct me if I'm wrong, Verlin, but I, I'm guessing it's a pretty safe place to be. Take your face mask, walk oh, yes. outside, and you'll have the place. A nice quiet place to browse around for yeah, right now we are we are somewhat restricted thanks to covid uh so if it's a large group oh I, i'm limited to seven at a time uh, because of social distancing and masks are required uh and i shouldn't have to say that that should be normal now but i'm saying it anyhow just as a reminder and uh so i, I, I welcome visitors but uh please be safe with uh, covid yeah, sounds like a great outing um, during these cold winter days. So yes, thank you, Verlin. Just a, a treasure trove of knowledge and information. Uh, we so appreciate it. I'm so glad that we have this recorded so that we can share this information with more people. If you have more questions, obviously reach out to Verlin. I will not have any answers for you. <laughs> so <laughs> to reach out to Verlin and ask, but I do thank you all so much for joining us tonight and hope to see you again very soon. Thank you everybody for coming and thanks for the opportunity.